Here we are in day number five of the Feast of Tabernacles. And as I said at the beginning, it seems to go faster as we get near the end of the feast. The more tired you get, the more food you've had, the less rest you've had, and it goes faster. And so we're here, day number five, it is the Sabbath. Those that were in attendance last night for the Bible study on the purpose for the Sabbath, I hope that was helpful. Um, it is the, as I mentioned, the first feast of the Lord in Leviticus 23, the Sabbath is, the time goes by quickly, and hopefully it's been a wonderful feast for you so far. My wife and I have been very busy, but we really feel this has been a very inspiring feast. Yesterday, uh, we had a lot of guests that came in. Uh, there were multiple different parts of the body of Christ here yesterday, and we really just enjoyed that. Uh, I saw some folks I haven't seen in a very long time. Uh, so did Kathy, and it's been a long time, at least for me. I mean, a very long time. Good. Well, it's off. It is off. The light, the blue light of darkness has disappeared. Okay. But we build, what we're doing is we're building relationships that will last through eternity. Have you ever thought about this? People you meet and you cross paths with over the years, and sometimes you don't see them for 10, 20, 30 years, and then you see them and it's like time stood still. Years ago, it used to be uh, in the late 60s and 70s, and on past that a bit, we could travel anywhere, just about in the world, but anywhere in the United States, and walk into a congregation and know somebody. And many of you are like that. Um, yep. Oh, yeah, all right. Um, those relationships. And, you know, something I'd like us to think about, because this world is going to pass away. Many of us are going to pass to the death and then be resurrected. But the relationships we have, sorry, Jan, but we're going to be friends for the rest of eternity. That's a long time. You ever try to measure eternity? And so we spend a good day here at the part of the day at the community center. We eat meals, we worship. And we still, though, see when we go out to go home and when we come in, the world in plain sight. And that beautiful gulf out there that you look at in the mornings and afternoon and evenings, and how many of you saw the moon last night when it came up? That's why they call it Orange Beach. <laughs> it was like huge and orange. It wasn't full, but it was absolutely beautiful. I, I only other place I've seen the moon look like that was in Key West one time. And I saw on the front of my camera as the backdrop. But when we go for a walk outside the hotels, the condos, we drive to and from the hall, we see the world. When we go out to the beach, you see the world. It's beautiful, but sometimes you see things in the world you just don't need to see at the beach. When you turn on the news, which I know none of you watch, we see the world alive and there it is. I think of a song that I remember as a young lad, Stop the World, I Want to Get Off. I want to get off this world. I want to be not be. But yet, you know, we're part of it. There's many wonderful things. There's meals. There's sports events. There's activities. All those things. And they're not wrong. And they're enjoyable. But we should see a striking contrast between what we're here celebrating and commemorating and thinking about and pondering the glorious and wonderful future that these days of the Feast of Tabernacles foreshadow and the desperate and miserable present world of today. And I'm not a doom and gloom person, but I'm sorry, in the last 50 years of my life, because 
10 years and under, I don't remember. No, actually, I do. It has really changed. And it's not the place it used to be. And it's continuing to change. There are continuous financial troubles. The moral debates over issues there is no debating. Situation ethics. You all know what that is? Your ethical decision is based on the situation of how you view it through your lens instead of how God views it. The continuous wars around the world, they're still going on. You just don't always see some of them because the news here likes to get you focused on a missing person in the Tetons and the troubles between her and her boyfriend. Consumes the news so that you don't pay attention to what's going on in the real world. I'm not saying that's not a sad case, but that happens frequently. So we're distracted and focused like a nose ring in our nose pulling us wherever they want us to look. I think it was Don Henley had a song years ago, Dirty Laundry. Anybody remember it? It was having to do, I won't sing it for you, I could, I remember the lyrics. You know, some bobbleheaded beach blonde on MTV, you know. Talking about dirty laundry. Bad news. Well, the Middle East continues to have things going on. There's war on the precipice highlighted by the coming economic troubles, and we see the fulfillment of prophecy that's coming with it. And I, at times, wake up in the morning and I thank God for being alive, but I say, the world is still here. It's not what we're here celebrating that's coming. Where you and I live here in the United States daily grows a threat of war with various nations. If we don't see that, you're asleep. We don't want to become gloom and doom people, but we need to be continue to be absolutely aware of this world around us, but more importantly, our spiritual condition. Where are we with God, each one of us? Let's go together to the book of Acts, if you would, with me this morning. And I don't have any idea what time I started, so Felicia, when I start going too long, would you let me know? Not verbally, just, yeah. Okay, the book of Acts, chapter 3. Verse 19, it says, Repent you therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and He shall send Jesus Christ which was or before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all His holy prophets since the world began. And the sad thing is, this world, for the most part, simply has no idea what's about to happen in the very near future. Because if they did, they would live and do things differently. It's one of the reasons so many are absolutely terrified. I subscribe to a counseling referral uh, company that back when I had a private practice, a lot of potential counseling clients came through that. And I have not turned it off. In the last year, I averaged five to ten contacts a day. It used to be one a week. And you know what? I want to know what most of the requests are for? Anxiety, instability, family disruption, anger management, paranoia, 
and it's building. It's building. Doing the best it can, not knowing the solutions, and honestly not understanding the problem, the, the world just stumbles along. This morning, somebody coming in just stumbled and fell. Any of you, as you get older, sometimes stumble? You know, I do, I have. You stumble. Little things that would have never bothered you before. You know, that's part of the reason a handicapped parking area has so much room. Because sometimes you stumble and you need room to get in and out of the car carefully. Right? I don't see a lot of the folks that are down that live in this area retired running up to the elevator and jumping up and down and running out like the little kids I do. Why is that? So the world goes along, it stumbles along, yet here's what's interesting. All these things out here are foremost in God's mind because He's completely and entirely focused on it. He is. Stay with me. And so should we to be aware of what's happening. What do I mean by He is focused on? Because the government of God, the very literal kingdom of God should be foremost in our minds, and to clearly see that, we have to be aware of what is not the government of God. The world desperately needs the kingdom of God. Jimmy Ray's first part of his slideshow, uh, the parts that I saw, talked about the kingdom. Graham talked about, I believe, the four parts of a kingdom. Am I right? My memory still working? You know, a king, subjects, land, and laws. You have to have those things. I think that's what it was. That kingdom of God. The world desperately needs God's government to be reestablished in this world. And what? Remove all the others. They desperately need that. But what do we keep trying to do? Anybody remember the definition of insanity? Exactly. You expect you do the same thing over and over and over, and you expect different results. Can we say that about the governments of this world? You know, we've got a guy here that's really good at golfing. And if, if a pro tells him, you need to open the face of your club with 125 yards. And he says, nope, I've been hitting it this way for 20 years. There, okay. You know, and... I keep it down and the ball goes blip, 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 instead of lifting it up and dropping it so it doesn't roll and just hits and stays where it's supposed to land, right? And he says, no. Now, I'm just going to keep doing it the way I've always done it. And he's going to say, well, then it's going to take you 17 strokes for 125 yards instead of two or three. So you keep doing the same thing over. What do we keep doing in the government? We have different slogans, right? Way back, I remember a chicken in every pot. Different points of light. There's going to be change. We're going to unite whatever country it is. And at some point along the line, go back as far as you want in history, whether it was Nebuchadnezzar or Cyrus or the Roman Empire or the Chaldeans, or pick a country. Is there a country in the United States that has the perfect government? Benjamin Franklin, what did he say, Gail? Democracy is the worst form of government, except for all those others man has tried from time to time. By the way, the United States is not a democracy. Did you know that? We're a Federalist Republic. Are you confused? Good study. That's part of the problem, too. We're not, well, actually, we're becoming more socialistic than we are definitely than Federalist Re Federal Republic. But that's a whole other message. 
I've mentioned before that God is here with us during the feast. He needs to be with us, and as we watch the world going through what it continues to go through, it has to be changed. It's been my experience after almost 60 years in the church of God that we're going to go home from the Feast of Tabernacles and the last great day or eighth day, but it won't take very long. Reality sets in, and we're right back into our normal routine. Part of that routine is fine, but part of it's not fine. It's not. One of the things I look forward to every day is I can be tired and, you know, drained a little bit, but when I walk in this room and the people start to filter in, it's really funny. It's been this way every year. As the feast goes on, the people start, the brethren start coming later and later and later and later. And they look kind of tired like they had a good meal last night and they were up talking. And that's fine. But we, if we're not careful, we'll go back home and we'll fall right back into some things that are routine that aren't good. There are some very real lessons from the feast that we need to hang on to and to help us remember what is coming? Okay, what's coming? If you want a title for this message, it's Living for the Kingdom of God. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 11 together. Revelation chapter 11. At verse 15, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, the kingdoms of this world have become or are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God in their seats fell upon their faces, and they worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which are and was and are to come, because you have taken to you your great power and have reigned. Now, what happens? And the nations were angry. Why? Because we, every single time a new president administration comes into the country, what do they want to do? They want to change it for their vision. Because the rest of us uneducated folks don't see that vision like they think we should. So you get the yo-yo effect, and it's always been that way. You get a different emperor, a different leader in the ancient times that came in and changed everything, wiped it out. That's why I tell people there's no job security in this world. I used to own a company where we would do maintenance for restaurants, and you'd get a good relationship going. You'd understand this working where you have you get a good relationship going with somebody, and then they would take them out and bring in somebody that was trying to make a name for themselves. And the first thing they did was they got rid of everything that had been done because they knew better. It didn't matter, the initial effect. So I would get comfortable working, doing the work, getting paid, and then it would, you'd have seven restaurants gone like that. And I would just wait it out, and usually a year and a half or a year later, They'd bring the other person back in, and they'd call you back up. And, but the other person was all the, had all these ideas that were going to work better. Well, we keep trying that over and over. And he says, so the world, as we look here, the nations were angry, and thy wrath has come in the time of the dead. You know, it means the, the Greek word ethnos, the nations, that they should be judged there's this final judgment, a very brief period of time. They should give reward to the servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear your name, small and great, and should destroy them which corrupt the earth. The kingdom of God is not some fuzzy, warm feeling in your heart. It's not some kind of churchy organization that will seek to bring out the inner good in man. It's not an emotional feeling or warmth. 
Years ago, I was on a writing team for a magazine called Vertical Thought. It doesn't exist anymore. And I wrote an article entitled, Oh, What a Feeling, explaining what conversion is. And I got quite a bit of response, not very favorable, because I stepped on the toes of much of what modern religion teaches, that you just feel Jesus in your heart, and you become warm like butter that Kathy puts on her toast in the morning. It just kind of spreads the love evenly. And I'm not saying that we can't feel better, but the kingdom of God certainly is not, as some believed at the turn of the century, the British monarchy and empire. It does matter, by the way, which God you worship. Do you know that? Oh, it doesn't matter. You can worship anybody you want. No, you can't. God is a jealous God. What are the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Not me, but God, meaning saying me. It does matter what religion you're part of. It does matter what government you give your allegiance to. I'm hoping they're going back to prepare the food and I didn't say something. <laughs> yes, okay, they're going to work on the food. Uh, you know, it's uh, one time I had a whole row of people get up and leave, and I'm like, okay, and they had all had to go do something, so they hadn't told me that, so that's fine. It does matter what government you give your allegiance to. What did we say as children? This may get me flagged off of Facebook. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty. Anyway, we said I pledge allegiance, right, to the flag. Well, it's a flag, right? What does it represent? Because the kingdom of God is a literal government that will take over the rulership and the authority of every government of this world. There will no longer be a United States Congress. I almost said praise God, but a British Parliament, an Israel Knesset, a president, prime minister, or other head of state, all of these will cease to be. And all authority and ruling power will be vested entirely in what? Of God. And administered through Jesus Christ where? On this earth. I remember going back, it's been a few years, during our Feast of Tabernacles in Argentina, probably about 2007, the reality of how an earthly government rules it was made even more apparent to me in Bolivia. Residents of that country became upset with their government, and they started to blow up roads so no one could pass. Some of God's children were affected. They were unable to travel to the feast and, and other things. The president of Bolivia wanted to export natural gas to the United States and Canada. And the citizens of Bolivia said, before you do that, we want to use it in our own country to better our conditions. Well, in history, Bolivia's seaport was supposedly stolen by Chile, and Chile began charging them on items they wished to export. So you start, I started to look into it to understand what was going on, and we see that happening Today, we witnessed this firsthand in East Africa when all the power would go off during the feast. Remember that, Gail? The power just went off. And I thought, wow, it must be because of poverty and you know, all the things. No, the government just turned it off so that Americans would say, oh, they're going without electricity. We'll send you over $5 million. And they never saw it. Because they took it for themselves. The same thing with food. I don't know if you saw this when the C-130s, Bruce, would drop some of the 
the things back during the Clinton administration, they would drop these big things to the Somalians, these big pallets. And the news media, oh, wonderful humanitarian aid they're sending. And I had someone who worked there said, one out of 13 gets to the location. They drop them in the mountains. They drop them in the ocean. Millions of dollars. You remember what a C-130 costs per, per hour to run in the air? It's phenomenal, thousands of dollars to fly. So it, was, it wasn't doing any good, but it looked good on paper. And so, so many times, oh, you know, we're going to do this and help this, and you go down there later and you're like, where's the help? Where's the help? Well, it was all over television. Okay, maybe it was. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 11. In verse 18, here it says, destroy those who destroy the earth. By the way, this is not a climate change, global warming presentation, just for the record. It says, because of economics, politics, war, and ignorance, mankind has succeeded in destroying much of the present world that was given to us. Rather than dressing and keeping it like God told them in the Garden of Eden, He said to dress it and keep it, which meant to trim the bushes and cut the grass. What do we do? Violent men with violent ways have done violence to the earth. Let me explain, because I know the news media really pushes, even in countries outside the U.S., to buy into the global warming and climate change agenda that we're using up all of our natural resources, and that we need to love Mother Earth. The reason I want to comment, because that's a big push, most of that is agenda and simply not true, because global warming has been scientifically proven, you don't hear a lot about that, that it can't be proven, it's made up. We're not using up our natural resources, but we should take care of what we have not deliberately hurting it or destroying it. When I lived in Florida many years ago, I knew a man that would talk about it, and I watched him do it. There was a a ditch out in front of his house, and he would go off of his property, and he would drive up until he was over that ditch, both wheels. He would crawl under it, loosen the drain plug and move out of the way and let all the oil drain right down into the ground. And then he would tighten it up, you know, change the filter, put new oil in, and then drive down a bit and dry it. And and he said, oh, the sand, and it'll be fine. I said, the water level down here is really low. It's going straight in. He said, well, they'll filter it out. He said, the earth ain't going to hurt it. Well, I'm not saying that one time did necessarily, but I believe you don't do things like that. You know, but I'm also kind of OCD when it comes to driving down the road. I don't take my bohangles or bojangles and throw it out the window, you know, and just let it roll all over and say, ah, that's okay. Um, Let's go back to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 1. So God says you take care of things. But you don't go to the extent that you worship the earth. Paul talks about that. They worship the creation more than the creator. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 14, Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the good news, the gospel of the kingdom of God. a new family, a new civilization, a new government. That's what we're here living these eight days and talking about. And saying the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. You change, you repent, you turn around, you go the other way, and you believe that good news. You know, we have a sign out front. What does it say? Church of God Ministries, FOT 2021. In retrospect, we probably should have put Feast of Tabernacles. But what's interesting, I told my wife, this is going to be interesting when we go back home. Because I posted for the first time ever on my Facebook 
picture of my wife playing the flute where it says, Feast of Tabernacles. And one of my neighbors, I know he's going to want to talk about it, said, wow, good job, Gail. I wonder if he saw it. I don't know how you couldn't, right? But how many people out here know what the Feast of Tabernacles, actually there's more than you think, but how many of them know what that is? That's what we're here keeping, celebrating this temporary dwellings, Christ being here, God being with us, and that what? There's a time coming when all of this out there is going away. What did Christ preach? What was the message that was so important that He had to come as flesh and human blood to preach and then die for? The gospel of the kingdom of God. El Evangelio del Reino de Dios. The gospel of the kingdom of God. Let's go back to Luke. Luke chapter 4. The gospel of the kingdom of God was not just about Jesus Christ. The Bible doesn't teach that. What it teaches is what we're talking about here. Luke chapter 4, verse 42. And when it was day, he departed. And he went to the desert place, and the people sought him and came into him and stayed him. They said, stay here, that he should not leave. And he said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore am I sent. And he preached in the synagogues of Galilee. After, if you read the story, he had cast out demons, the people there wanted him to stay and teach them more. You know, my granddaughter, I hope this doesn't distract her, sometimes she says, more, 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 more. Right? Do we have that focus when we come to the Feast of Tabernacles? You know, when whoever's speaking is finishing and you're, you're saying more, he's done? Or is it, oh, thankfully, finally, let's go eat the good stuff. Get that out of the way. You know, do we want more of God's truth? Or do we want more of what's out there? That's the thing about the feast, too, by the way. It's, it's, a, it's a prerequisite showing us what's coming, but it ends after eight days, the temporary, and we go back into the world that we're part of to be a light, right? When you go home and your neighbor says, where you been? Are you going to say, oh, I want a vacation in Orange Beach? Oh, yeah, great. How was it? Great. Water was great. Food was great. Hotel was great. Good. What would you do all day? Oh, stuff. Or do you go back and say, we just got back from the Feast of Tabernacles. Whoa, what's that, weirdo? Something to think about. So, you see, but after he began to preach and talk about the kingdom of God, Jesus Christ had a mission. For those of you who remember the television series of the 1960s and 70s, you will no doubt remember the mission of Star Trek. Anybody remember? to boldly go where no man has gone before. Where are we going? Where are we going? Okay. Some people say, you know, I, I, if, if, I don't know where I'm going, but I'm making good time. Do we know where we're going? If I stay focused on what's happening in the world, I'm going to go somewhere. It's called C-R-A-Z-Y. Because the God of this world is C-R-A-Z-Y. So where are we going? Where is our focus? What is our mission? Because we are boldly going where no man has gone before except for one being that died and was resurrected and sits at the right hand of God. So we're going there. And He's going there and coming whether we're there or not. So we've got a choice to make. Christ's mission to preach the kingdom of God wasn't just in one place, it was in other cities also. He had a message to spread, and that message was his central focus. In Proverbs 28.1, what does it say? 
The wicked flee when none pursue, but the righteous are bold as a lion. He tells us we are to be bold. You know, there was somebody here with us the other day. We were near the hot tub, and they were asking questions. And I was like, go! I won't say her name, his, that person's name, but go! Get him! Get him. Now, I'm going to let, let her, she's doing great. You know? Are we willing to talk about what we live? And tell someone, how can you be so positive when this virus is around and everything's falling apart? And you can say, because there's a new government coming. There's a new world. The kingdom of God is coming. Yeah, but is that real? What'd they say to Noah when he's pounding away on the ark, you know? The old geezer, it ain't going to rain. Man, dude, it ain't rained in 50 years. And he just kept working. Because he boldly went where no one had ever gone before. How'd you like to be on a boat in water like that? Talk about the Edmund Fitzgerald. I don't think that boat ride was super just smooth and easy. I think there was some up and down, and the animals were, <laughs> you know, and maybe some of the stuff that was in the cages was a sloshing and a moving. I don't know. There wasn't no canoe on a calm river. He had a mission. Proverbs 21, Proverbs 28, 1 says that. If folks do not respond to it, to that message, that's God's problem, not ours. But we must continue to preach that gospel and then what? Most importantly, live it. And our focus must be as God's people. Come with me to the book of Matthew. Let's look at another example. Matthew chapter 10. Because this was the heart and the core of the message he wanted his disciples to take out there. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 5. These 12 that Jesus sent forth and commanded them. He commanded them. He said, go not into the way of the Gentiles into any city of Samaria. Don't enter, but go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Who was that? The ten tribes that were lost. Why were they lost? Why were they lost? Now, they were to heal, counsel, and provide comfort. No doubt they would encourage people to live better lives and provide Christian living type messages. But they all taught what revolved around it was because of that coming kingdom. Let's notice the book of Zechariah, Zechariah 14. One of the not so minor prophets, as I call it. Zechariah 14, I don't know if you can see my Bible from there, but it has a thousand written on it. You know what that thousand is talking about? What is the millennium? How many years is that going to be? Huh? Good, man. All right. You get to go to the next class. All right. Zechariah 14, verse 1, Behold, take note, stop, the day of the Lord comes, and the spoil shall be divided in the midst of you. For I will gather the nations against Jerusalem to battle, the city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished, and half of the city go forth into captivity, the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when He fought in the day of battle." And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. So when Christ comes back, is he going to Utah? People are sincere. Is he going to Cincinnati, Ohio? There was a man up there that believed that. I think he's in prison now. You know, he's definitely not coming to Orange Beach. Uh Uh-oh. His feet will stand upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, half of the mountain removed toward the north and half toward the south. That's a very descriptive example. And and you shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal. Yea, you shall flee like as you fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, 
and the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with God. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be the one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night, but shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. That's a good study if you don't know what that means. And it shall be in that day that living waters shall go forth out from Jerusalem, half toward the former sea, half toward them toward the, uh, the hinder sea, the Mediterranean. In summer and winter shall it be. And notice verse 9. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth in that day. Shall there be one Lord and His name one after he is voted in by the House of Representatives. No, I added that ridiculous comment. We are told these times are coming, but how much do we think about it? During this Feast of Tabernacles here in Orange Beach, are we spending the time studying, praying, asking God to help us become even more focused on what the Feast represents? Every day I've been asking different part of the family here, what are you going to do today? Not a trick question. And I get a good description of what you're going to do, and that's fine. But I'm going to let you know in a little secret. You know what I'm waiting for? I'm looking forward because we're going to go home today and have a little Bible discussion about what we heard today. That's what I've been waiting for. But I know it's the feast. Okay? Right now, you all are looking at the clock. It's 10 to 12, and lunch is cooking. I can smell it. And that's good, and we should look forward to it. But I'd like us to stop and reflect a little bit. What are we truly living for? It's a personal choice, a focused decision, but God knows our hearts. How much do you and I get caught up in the fast pace of this life and forget the fact that what we're talking about for these eight days is real and it's coming? Because someday you're going to look back, you know, I, I know there's at least one family here that understands what it means to get rid of a whole bunch of stuff, to sell it, to get rid of it. It's not yours anymore. It's gone. And what does it feel like? It's a relief. And it's not wrong to have things and enjoy them. No, don't get me wrong. But what is our focus? What is our focus? Maybe it's our grandchildren. I, I love my granddaughter. Oh, man, this has been awesome. Maybe it's our children. Maybe that we want to get married. Maybe we're moving. Maybe we have a new job. You fill in the blanks. Notice what does it say in verse 5. The saints. It comes from the Hebrew word meaning holy. When it's used for people, it means people who are holy because of their relationship with God. The same word is used in Exodus 19.16 you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Is this nation we live in right now holy? Is there a holy nation in this world? Verse 8 and 9, then comes the moment we've all been waiting for. Is this what we're living for? Is this the focus of our lives? Are we living every day knowing that what we're commemorating, observing, assembling, and fellowshipping, and worshiping God in for these eight days. It's what we are living for. When I was a small child, when the last day of the eighth, eighth day or last great day took place, you know what started to enter my mind? And I would ask my dad, where are we going next year for the feast? And he'd say, we haven't finished this one, but where are we going next year? Have any of you already thought that a little bit? Right? Y'all are invited back here, by the way, if you'd like. Hope you'll consider it, but there's a whole bunch of options out there. Are we thinking about what is coming? Because someday, when the kingdom of God is here, what does it say? Which, ver which series of holy days does it say? And every year they shall go up to keep 
the feast. Right? And if they don't keep it, what happens? No rain. Okay? We've had a lot of rain in Alabama this summer. I, we've just been, it's just been wonderful. A little too much, actually, sometimes. But it's not always been like that. And not all parts of the country are like that. You know what gets people's attention as much as anything when it doesn't rain? <laughs> because then you don't have food and crops. And God says, if you don't want to come up and keep the feast, guess what? You can run out of food. And when we run out of food, that's what I'm concerned about in the world. Anybody been noticing at your grocery stores down here where we live, they just aren't always stocked like they used to be because they can't get stuff? It's the old Bachman Turner Overdrive song. You ain't seen nothing yet. And so, look at verse 20 and 21, how much a part of their lives the worship of God will be. Reminders, the God of creation will be everywhere, not out of some kind of outward show or piety, but a sincere desire to honor Him in everything we do. We want to, don't want to become shallow or half-hearted in our worship of God, but do we ask ourselves, do we come close to the involvement with God to the level that we need to? I don't know if, if you're still teaching or not. I think you are, but that's got to be one real challenge today versus what it was several years ago. I don't think I could do it. I would be locked up for anger management. You know? I wouldn't want to be, you know, as much as I may not agree with certain philosophies, I wouldn't want to be the press secretary of any president. I wouldn't. To try to give an answer for the hope that lies within you and what you believe, whether good, bad, or indifferent? How much of a part of us is God? Are we part of the body of Christ? I don't even like to say church, although that's ecclesia means the called out ones because then some associate that with a specific group. But how much is a part of the body of Christ? Are we here to save our skins? Let's be honest. A lot of people came in many years ago because they were afraid of what was coming. And some still are. And if I could promise them that the great tribulation wasn't going to come and they weren't ever going to be hungry or be persecuted, do you think they'd stay and keep attending? I don't know. I'm just asking questions that are getting lots of weird looks, like don't go there. We read here in Zechariah, there will no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of, God, of hosts. So you mean there's not going to be any Gentile person in the kingdom? That's an absurd conclusion. It means there won't be anyone who is a stranger who is estranged from God. All who are there will be part of the kingdom of God intimately. Let's look at what the book of Micah says, Micah chapter 4. Micah chapter 4 and verse 1. In the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains. It shall be exalted above the hills. I think Graham may have read this. The people will flow unto it. And many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountains of the Lord, or the mountain rather, to the house of God of Jacob. He will teach us His ways. We will walk in His paths. For the law shall go forth out of Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among people and rebuke strong nations afar. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations will not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree. And every man will raise chickens. Oh, I added that for Eric's sake. And none shall make them afraid. You know what we're afraid of in the United States right now? Taking away the opportunity to do what we want to do. Are we not? For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. For all the people will walk, every one in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever in and ever. 
So mountain is used figuratively as a symbol of strength and stability. And as much as they're used to few of government figures and kingdoms, from David's kingdom, mentioned in Psalm 30, to the Chaldean kingdom, to the kingdom of God, from this kingdom will come teaching, teaching about the laws of this kingdom. How many of you know all the laws of God and you have it to memory? How many of you are ready to coordinate and teach for 25 or 30,000 feast sites? Remember the numbers I gave the other night? How many different feast sites there's going to be? If there were only 5,000 in each one, you remember that? We forget that We are going to be, what, kings and priests and be teaching? I've taught to 14,000 people. Now I'm teaching to a smaller percentage of that, even with those online. And so we are going to be the saints of the Most High God, teaching about the laws of that kingdom, as Graham talked about, what it stands for, what it requires of its citizens, and what it promises them. And those promises will be kept. We almost become sarcastic now when we hear a politician promise things. We go, yeah, sure, right? How about in marriage? I promise to faithfully love you, to cherish you, to provide for you. Remember those from your vows? And what happens? I'm going to change those promises. Sorry. you got to understand. And so the world does it over and over and over. We're going to be instrumental in getting this teaching to humanity. We will not be there, as some have taught, to teach people to simply submit, bang them around, right? As some like to say, but to live and have a relationship with God. I've had some over the years who have said, you know, I get discouraged. I don't feel like I'm doing anything. I hope everyone here feels like you've been involved and been able to be part of what we're doing. And I thank all of you. I won't mention your name because I may miss one or two people. But you all have had a specific part in helping. The very fact that most of you have been here almost every day is huge. The Bible study, I was really encouraged. You know, We need to define what church is a bit and what helping. Living for the kingdom of God does not mean you're simply speaking at church or you're song leading. And the definition of song leading has changed, hasn't it? Since Graham's been here, we love it. The first thing he said, can I play a guitar instead of wave my arms? I said, well, sometimes I don't even wave my arms, right, Nana? I just stand there and try to keep from tipping over. Um, we learn that what? That's what's important. Or I'm in charge of something. Don't you love that? You feel good when you're in charge of something? I can't get Jan to be in charge of anything. I'll help. No, you're in charge of special music. No, no, I'll help. And Rich can help. And she can help. And he can help, right? So I just don't ask you to be in charge of anything. I just say, see Jan. And then she delegates to Rich, who delegates to Kathy, who delegates to, you know, we haven't delegated to Harry yet, or Lorna, we got to do that, so maybe next year. That kingdom of God that we live for, it doesn't mean that you aspire to be a deacon, an elder, and I'm not into all that stuff, but, or that you, whatever it is, you fill in the blank. Living means your, your focus is on that kingdom. Matthew 6 tells us to seek first God's kingdom and His righteousness. Amos chapter 9 has an interesting, you can write it down, verse 13 to 15. It says, no longer will we be pulled up. What does that mean? No longer will you be, I term it, transferred, told you got to move. You have to move. Right? Some of us have moved a lot. You've been transferred. You've lived various places. You know, I visit some people. My mom, she may be watching, she's been in the same house. How many years is it now, Gail? Huh? 
I don't know, it's a long time, probably almost 50 years, I think. You know? Some of us have lived in 50 different places almost. There's something to be said about planting roots where you live and you know the community and the people, and there's something to be said about that. I still can't, it's getting better, but I've lived now a little over four years up in Spanish Fort, and I'm hoping to stay there. Sorry, Felicia. I'm hoping to stay there till I, I don't know what happens. I don't think God intended us to be as mobile, be moving as much, and living in all these large cities. Not that they're sin, but I don't, I don't like cities. I like room. I'm anxious to go visit the parish ranch or whatever it is someday. Make sure it's in the warm months, though. Do we live for the kingdom of God? You know, we can sometimes become discouraged with the troubles in life. It can distract us. What did God tell David to continually to do? To turn to Him, to look to Him, to look for that kingdom. It's a calling that you and I have. The world, as it continues to go on, unaware of the dangers ahead, unaware of the solutions, what's going to happen? When we're told to be a light and example, is it going to look to some of us and say, okay, I want to know something. Why are you still smiling and happy? And you say, well, because I have a little bit of oil in my cupboard and some wheat to make bread if you can have wheat. You do? Well, where'd you get it? I don't know. It just keeps showing up every day. Anybody remember that story? You really think that we go to the stores, they're always going to have food? You think God can protect you when you're the only one that has food? Right? Oh, there's so much more I could say, but I remember 25, it's been about 30 years ago, I asked a question during a sermon. I think it was at the feast. If I said, if I were, to, if I were told Christ was going to return, somehow, somebody told me that, and the date was given, and you knew for a fact, and I knew that that was legit, folks would be attending, we would be packed from here all the way to the back at every feast site out there. We'd have to keep them at the door and say, the fire code says 299, we can't take anymore. Folks would be mending issues with one another. Other things would be less important. Building a relationship with each other. And most importantly, when we do it with God, it then fixes this humanity that we have. I believe for the most part we do keep that vision in our front of our minds. But we must never lose sight of God's holy days, His Sabbath, the zeal and desire for a different kingdom. I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but the guy that used to be president, if he comes back, it's not going to fix this. I'm so tired of hearing that. Make America great again. It isn't going to matter. Do anybody see what's happening, where we are? The only solution is for the King of kings and Lord of lords to be sent back and come back here and change this, to change it. Galatians 2.20, you all know it. I am crucified. We are crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, we live, but it's not us that lives. It is the faith of the Son of God that gave Himself for us, that lives in us. That's how we live. And that living in us, that Holy Spirit, is not part of this world. It's a different world. It's a different king because that being that lives in us through God's Spirit is that coming king. That's how we can live. The gospel of the kingdom of God, that gospel message, Christ came to live and preach. We live for it. We struggle for it. We sacrifice. And if time be long enough, we're going to have to die with the hope of it. 
It's a kingdom, a government that will be here in the future to introduce to the world a life it has never known before. When you can say, look, it's going to be okay. I have good news for you. If you'll just listen, I can say, this is the way. Walk, live it, let it be part of you. We'll return from the feast and headed home in a couple, three days. And dear brethren, I ask you to go to your notes, dig in, study, go back over the messages, talk about them with your mate, your family, the other brethren. Keep the things you've heard during this feast in your mind along with your responsibility and loyalty to that government. Please don't get caught up because the world's going to get really shaky. The Ed Fitzgerald is going to take place in this world on a massive scale. Don't get focused on yourself, on the news, the troubles, the chaos. Keep serving others in and out of the body of Christ, living for God's kingdom, because all other things will pass away. Anything you and I build doesn't matter what it is. It's not going to last forever. Anything that we build physically will not. It must be that faith of Jesus Christ living in it. It must be our hope. It must be our calling. It is our life. And we must live for the kingdom of God. This feast pictures a glorious future, a kingdom that is coming. God speed that day. If you join me with in prayer, we'll finish this morning. Our Father in heaven, we come before your throne. We thank you. We love you. We are ever so grateful for the fellowship of the unity of the Spirit, which transcends everything in this world, Father, because it comes from you and Jesus Christ. And we pray for the peace that passes all understanding, that comfort, that patience, that tranquility, and that desire and focus for what's coming. We pray your will be done, but we also pray thy kingdom come. And Lord, do so. Please come quickly. We ask your blessing on the meal today. Nourish us with it. Nourish the fellowship. Please protect us. Please continue to be with us and help us to finish out the remaining days of your Feast of Tabernacles and that last great day, the eighth day that pictures when every being that's ever lived will have the opportunity for salvation, to repent, to change, and to live and be part of that kingdom. God, we thank you. We praise your name, and we ask this in and through and by the authority in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.